Hi, and welcome to this episode of A Sip of Inspiration. We're doing a series of Zoom segments uh, because of the COVID-19, and last week we did one on our favorite topic, which is money, 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 how to make smart money moves in a financial crisis or in no crisis at all. And as you trawl through all of the feed that's on Facebook, there is a lot of concern and a lot of information for probably the first time in a long time about health disparities. COVID-19 seems to be taking about 70% of the uh, casualties are African Americans and now we're finally talking about health disparities. So joining me today to have the conversation about health disparities and something I learned about in talking to Karen this week, and that is unspoken health care. I had no idea something like unspoken health care existed. I knew about health disparities, but that unspoken health care thing, we got to know about that. So I want to welcome Dr. Karen Huntley to my show today from Florida. So thank you very much much for joining me today. Thank you, Stephanie, for allowing me to join you today. Um, hello, family. Um, my name is Dr. Karen Huntley. I am a board certified nurse practitioner with a doctorate degree. Um, I am a family practice and I see a lot that goes on. I've been in healthcare, wow, for about 20 years. So this topic with healthcare disparities hits close to home. Plus, because I have seen it up close and personal, not once, but multiple times. So I am so grateful that Stephanie has allowed me to talk to everybody about this topic. And I hope that I can give you some insight on how healthcare has progressed and how it hasn't pertaining to the minority and the healthcare that we receive and that we need and that we face in the future. So... You, did, you said something key. It's like every, we're in 2020 and there's a lot going on. I mean, we can work from home. We have vehicles that don't require uh, gas. We can uh, trade money and buy things from across the world. And you just told us that healthcare hasn't kept up with that, with that trend. So what's going on with healthcare and why is it lagging behind the rest of the world? The reason it's lagging behind the rest of the world is because of our, um, the prejudices that we still do face. Even though we say that everyone is equal, equality lives in our country, the USA of A is ahead of the curve, we really were not. You know, our health care pertaining to minorities, oftentimes, you know, it's a lack of education on a part of our of our, of our people. On the other part is the information not being available. The other part, the healthcare providers just simply feel, oh, they're not gonna understand. How do they know that? They don't know that, they assume that. And if, you know the saying, if you assume something, you make a, you know what. And that's so, right. You know, and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. And one of the goals in healthcare is healthcare literacy. But when the provider doesn't want to provide that information because they have the assumption that the patient, especially a woman, a minority, is not going to understand the language and they don't have time to explain it, they just say, well, just take the medicine and just follow up in a month. In a month's time, a lot can happen. If the person takes a medicine and doesn't know the consequences behind it, it can lead to other problems such as up to leading to death, such as if someone takes a blood thinner and the provider such as myself, I don't explain to you, you can't eat green leaf or vegetables, you can't drink wine, and then you end up bleeding simply because you decide to eat spinach salad three times a, three times a day, seven days a week. And that's contraindicated. So, without the education from the providers, without the education given to the people served, no matter the color, no matter who they are, we have a losing battle. But unfortunately for people of color, for our minority people, what is happening 
is the information is simply not being put forth as it should be. So with that said, you know, there's a lot of disparity that happens. You know, there's a lot of studies also in medicine, in medications that is not even geared towards the black people. A lot of the medication given is only meant for our fair sisters and brothers. It's not even tested on us. So they don't even know if it works for us. You know, our kidney function studies, we have different numbers. That plays a lot in the medications we give. So if we don't share this knowledge with people that we're looking at you mm -hmm. as an individual, and then you have the doctors, the, the physicians, the MDs that are based in science, and they're not sharing this science to the minorities, we're not taking it seriously. It's like, okay, he said to take this medicine. I don't know why. I'm not going to take it. So you don't take it. What happens? You get worse because you don't know why to take it. Then the okay. physician is thinking, well, they're not going to take it. And then you follow up with them, your numbers, your blood pressure is worse. You know, the cancer is worse. Your condition is worse. Because it's like you weren't told how serious your condition is. You weren't told how serious, how important it is to take that medication and what it means to you to survive. And I see this day in, day out. And it's like, okay, I go into a patient's room. And I say, my name is Dr. Huntley. They're looking at me like, you're what? Right. <laughs> it's like, and I get different reactions, you know. And the worst reactions I get is from our own people. It's like, you're the doctor for real. <laughs> for real? So, you know, it's a two-edged sword. It's a two-way street, you know. Because for so long, we've been taught to to take the back road, to take the back seat, you know, it's like, oh, my health care is not as important. It doesn't matter. I'll be all right. And that's one of the things in disparity because we weren't taught to take our health care seriously because we're always given quote unquote back seat. Okay. So, so let's talk about, you've said a, a lot and I uh, was thinking uh, let's go back to the trials where we you talked about a lot of the the pharmaceutical trials for drugs that are being prescribed to mm -hmm. us. We were not even included in the control group. So correct. And, and hearing that, it sounds like some six two white male that's one hundred and fifty pounds is being correct. in the trial group, but I'm five eight and uh, more than that. And African American, and have no idea, and a woman. Right. So, is that information we should ask the doctors when prescribing? Is who was the trial group? How do we get the science from the doctors? Well, sometimes the doctors will be forthcoming and telling you that. But, however, the unfortunate part of the trial group, oftentimes when they say, you know, we need volunteers uh -huh. to test out this medication. Oftentimes, you're not going to find a black person to say, yay, I'll do it. And I can tell you why. It goes back to the times of Tuskegee mm -hmm. with the syphilis. Mm -hmm. You know, they infected all these men with syphilis in the, in the 50s. And yes. they did it for about 20 years. So that generation remembers that. And it carries forward. And they imported it onto our generation because it's like they infected these men with syphilis to see the effects of it. So they don't trust the doctors, they don't trust the medicine. And then what happens that influences each generation. So the trial studies are not there for us because we're not doing it because we're afraid of the effect. And then moving forward to the HIV trials, you know, they have those clinical trials mm -hmm. where They'll take most. They'll take a black person who's on their successful HIV treatment and take them off of it and give them placebo, and then they turn up with full blown AIDS and end up dying. So therefore, you have all of this out there, and the physician may not tell you, you know, oh, well, only two percent of African Americans participated in clinical trials. 
compared to 45% Caucasian who participated. So Most when a doctor, kind of same thing. Yeah, so if a doctor takes you off of a meds, like you mentioned in like in the, one of the HIV trials and put you on a placebo, do they tell you or they just do it? Or is it just a casual conversation? Because that should be a serious conversation. Well, if, it's, if the physician decides to take you off of your medication, mm -hmm. you know, the critical question that you need to ask, that the person needs to ask is like, what is the study? What is the science behind you changing my medication? Okay. What is the efficacy? Efficacy meaning how beneficial is it to me? I know I'm using a lot of big words. That's all right. And, and these are words that moving in 2020, we have to know these words. We, know, we need to know this lingo so we can face the giant. The whole key to decreasing healthcare disparities is facing that giant head on. You know, it's the lingo. If you go to the healthcare provider and say, well, how successful was this medication in my ethnic group? That doctor's gonna take a second look and go, well, that's a good question. <laughs> You know, you ask me that, I'll be like, oh, well, wait a minute. Let me see what Hippocrates is saying about that because we have the tools on our phones. If I get a question, I just don't Google it. I have apps on here, medical apps. Then I'll tell my patient, I said, that's a really good question. Let me research that and I'll get back to you. But if you don't ask those questions. You don't get the answers. You don't get the answers. So when you go to the doctor, when someone goes to the doctor, even for a regular checkup, what is a list of things they should ask the doctor? And what things should they monitor prior to going to the doctor? Because, you know, you're making the doctor's appointment, you know at least 30 days in advance that you're going. So should we come prepared to discuss certain information? And what is it? And... What should we expect? How do we get in the driver's seat of our own doctor's appointments? To get in the driver's seat, you have to know everything about your condition. You have to know exactly what you're suffering from. You have to know the outcome from what you're suffering from. And you have to know what your medications are and what the side effects are. So when you go to the doctor, I'm gonna use blood pressure again, or if you have heart failure, you know, are you taking your daily weights? Are you taking your daily blood pressures? Are you monitoring what uh, foods are you taking in? Are you eating everyday fried chicken and you're wondering why your legs are looking like elephants? You know, was, okay. did anyone teach you about a diet? You know, when you go to the doctor, you keep a, you keep a diary. It take you know, you can go to like Walgreens, CVS, get a $5 blood pressure cuff when they have them on sale, take, take your log with you, be prepared. Because if you just show up to a doctor's office, this is what they're gonna do. Mrs. Smith, how are you? I'm good. Do you have any complaints? No. How are you feeling? I'm good. Yeah. All right, so here's your, here's your script. Um, I'll see you, wait, I'll see you <laughs> in, um, 10 weeks. <laughs> Bye. See the cashier on the way out, right? <laughs> and make sure you pay your bill on the way out. Oh, I'll see right. you later. And then they do their progress note, and it's like, yeah, Mrs. Smith came in. Her blood pressure today was 145 over 90. That, that was a little high, but that's okay. Oh, her weight, she went up like 10 pounds, but she said she was fine. So, okay. All right. Her legs were a little big, but yeah, she's already on a water pill. I'll just see her in six weeks. And the progress. Okay. Mrs. Smith. <laughs> Mrs. Smith, she has that appointment in six weeks. In four weeks, she's in the hospital in full heart failure. So where was the disconnect? It started with Mrs. Smith being the typical black woman. I'm fine talking to her blue-eyed, blonde doctor. I'm good. Ooh, he's cute. Ooh, <laughs> I'm good. She didn't tell him 
Every week I've gained five pounds. Every day I've become more short of breath. Every day my blood pressure has went up. Okay. We have our part. We have to take responsibility for our health as well. So we should know our numbers and our numbers being what we weigh and if it's fluctuating. So we should weigh at least once a week and we should know our blood pressure and we should have a diary of what we eat and how we eat. And if we gain weight, we would know it. Right. Especially if you have heart failure. Right. Now everybody has different, different health issues. Like if you have someone with epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Epilepsy is one of the biggest um, killers too because if you're not monitoring what you're taking, if you're not doing the regular blood work to monitor your levels, you know, if you're not say, keeping a diary again, how many seizures have I had in a month? Did I have any or am I having one every day? Am I having every one every day? I need to see the doctor. I need to tell him the medicine is not working. You just can't go on a doctor's go, I'm good. Because when you go somewhere, we typically, as a normal human being, you freeze up. You forget things because here's a doctor like, so tell me about what's going on. Right. People freeze. You know, when you have a medical condition, know about it. Read about it. There's a lot of health illiteracy, meaning we don't even know what's wrong with ourselves. And that's half the battle know what's wrong with you and then bring it to the table have those open discussions okay if you're afraid to do it take a loved one with you that knows your health history mm -hmm. that knows what you take because oftentimes you'll have the wives the husbands that come in and they're that voice piece or they'll have the grandsons the granddaughters come in with grandma grandpa so the biggest battle is communication okay we're gonna uh, our stream disconnected from Facebook so we're going to reconnect so give me a second from uh, I didn't realize it disconnected so it's preparing live stream preview again because this is great information we don't want our Facebook audience to um, not get it and we are going live again We've reconnected back to Facebook. Fantastic. So when we go in, we need to know why we're there. And then we need to provide the doctor with some information, right? Correct. So, because the doctor can't read our minds. And when we say, oh, I'm good or I'm doing fine, I think a lot of us are expecting the doctor to ask more follow-up questions when that's just not the case. They're not asking follow-up questions. They're taking you at your word. They're saying, oh, like you said, oh, she's fine. So when they look at what little bit of information we provide, and for those of listening, that's all they have. They don't know that you had a headache every day for seven days or that uh, your temperature was high because you were feeling warm. They don't know that your stomach was upset for 75% of the month. You have to tell them that because we, if we don't, they don't know. Now, what do you do when you tell them that? Because I've often asked the doctors for the science and they don't know the science. So I say, uh, so don't prescribe me a med that you're not familiar with the science on. And let me do my research, you do your research and we can talk tomorrow because you can always give me a prescription. Uh, so what do you do when they don't believe you when you say you know i've had you know an epilepsy i've had a lot more seizures than normal or in blood pressure i've had a lot more headaches or been more lethargic or you know my ankles are swelling more what what do you do how do you get that doctor's attention to get the doctor's attention is exactly what you just said you know now you're presenting with these symptoms you know when someone presents to me with those symptoms, I'm in front of the computer screen, I'm looking at them, and I ask these questions. Are you taking your medication? Do you understand what your medications do? Are you able to afford your medication? The other thing with healthcare in the minority, 
population is affordability. You know, a lot of these medications can be expensive. A lot of the pharmaceutical companies do have money that they could have medication assistance. And oftentimes the doctors will tell you, if you can't afford it, let me know. We can get you the help to afford it. Um, so in our, in our society today, there's no excuse to not have medication. With all the resources that are out there, you know, there is help. But again, it takes the consumer, and we're big consumers, because in a heartbeat, we'll go and buy that coach purse, we'll go buy that Louis Vuitton, and we don't want to hear about anything about going to the doctor and buying medicine, and then we wonder why our hair is falling out. So <laughs> it's about asking those questions. It's about communicating and not being afraid to communicate. Even if you think you're going to sound stupid, an unasked question is the mark of stupidity. If you don't ask a question, if you don't say what's, what's going on, I can't help you. I can't help you. You know, and I tell my patients that. I'm like, talk to me. What is happening? What's going on? And then, you know, for me, you know, I have the best of both worlds, you know, being a nurse and now being the doctor of nursing practice and working with physicians, I have the best of both worlds because I understand more on the nursing science side what communication is to hear what is not said. When my patient comes to me, it's it's hearing what's not said. And in the minority population, our people, in women, in Indian population, American Indian population, in American Chinese population, it's hearing what's not said. Okay. And it's the cultural competency. You know, but however, it takes the patient to talk to you. Okay, I've got a couple more questions and success for those of you who are watching. We have successfully launched live on Facebook. So that's why I've been over here typing. It's like, my God, I didn't know it was rocket science. <laughs> so... So we talked about some of the steps that we can take individually. So for those of you who are listening, write this down. Get a journal. They are dollar at the dollar store. It doesn't have to be a fancy journal. Just a notebook where you can record the days, uh, the dates and the times, and just a description of what happened. Because as uh, Dr. Huntley said, we don't remember. We When we enter the doctor's office, we suddenly don't remember. And... That makes sense because who can remember, many people don't remember what they had for breakfast last week, not alone that they had a, a seizure. So that's our responsibility. And don't be shy. I want you to remember the relationship that you have with the doctor. I always say, you're paying the doctor. You work or do whatever you do to pay the insurance company so that they can pay the doctor. The doctor isn't paying you. So your doctor is working for you. So make sure that this person that is working for you is earning the money that he is making uh, because he works for, or she works for you. Um, be sure you ask specific questions about medications. And as Dr. Huntley said, we all have this thing called a telephone. So make sure that we use this thing called a telephone. Um, and look it up. Web, uh, WebMD and a couple other sites can give you enough information for you to ask questions and things that you should know the answers to. So, and since the doc, and even Dr. Huntley said, they have apps that they use too to get information. So you're kind of like on an even playing ground. They don't walk around with this information all in their head. So they depend on that too. So what steps can we take overall to help improve the health care of minorities uh, and and people at the poverty level, because it's not just minorities. I'm sure people at the poverty level have the same issue too. For years, for decades, that has been a big question from healthy people 2020, I mean 2010 to 2020, that has been the big issue, the poverty level. And it's rising, especially now with this COVID, it's rising. Um, and as, as 
the United States tries to combat it, there's not an easy answer. You know, people at a poverty level, they're going to pick food over medicine. Okay, hands down. You know, That's right. and as food a, over medicine. And as a community, we have to rally together. You know, we have to support those free clinics. We have to support, you know, those, those people in those doctor's offices that give away medicines to those that need it. Um, the hospitals are being overburdened because people come to the hospital for medical treatment. You know, there is no easy answer to the poverty that faces the United States. Even though we're the richest country in the world, are people still suffering? especially our minority people, you know, again, people are going to pick food over medicine. Mm -hmm. So now the health care is suffering. Their conditions are getting worse. So by the time they get to the hospital, they're almost dying. And the condition cannot be reversed. It cannot be controlled. Um, that's why you have a lot of the minority people who are coming in with heart attacks. You know, at 45, they're dying of heart attacks because they never could afford the blood pressure medication. You have people at 16 years old dying of epileptic seizures because their parents could not afford the seizure medications. This is a topic that there's no answer immediate for us because we're not a socialistic society that everyone gets health care for free, all the medicine is paid, everyone gets taken care of. That's not the case here you know that's not the case here you know and until we have that answer to provide health care that is paid for and and safe for people that is going to be our battle and it's going to be a battle for a long time so now what about i was just thinking you know we see all those ads about Oh, download this app or call this medical, uh, this pharmaceutical company to get uh, your meds for five dollars if you can't afford it. Is that really working? How efficient is that? It is efficient if you have insurance. Ah, if you have. Oh, that's the key. So all they're doing is healthcare. All they're doing is building the insurance company for the maximum they could get and then only making you have a $5 copay. So it seems to be free. Oh, got it. I spoke in healthcare. Yeah. So, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh, wow, that's good. It's only going to be $11. It's just like, okay, but you've got healthcare and they're billing the health the insurance company probably for the maximum exactly like you'll have people who's taking all these expensive um treatments uh -huh. right but they have to have insurance okay their treatment so, is covered five dollars but do you have insurance okay so they're getting it paid. depends on the insurance you have if you have Medicare, no, Medicaid, mm -hmm. okay, if you have Medicaid, forget about it. If you have Blue Cross Blue Shield, if you have Humana, if you have um, what's it, Aetna, you're good. You're good. You have good insurance. If you have Medicaid, forget it. Forget about it. It's like they'll do the bare minimum to get the treatment you need. To just barely keep you alive without wow. letting you go. Okay, so you just busted my bubble. It's like I thought, I'm sorry. I thought, oh my God, they can go there, but they can't go there. Okay. I am uh, still having uh, some Facebook uh, issues, but I think it's the user and not the Facebook. So I apologize. We are recording this, so we'll do our best to get it out and post it so people can see it. We did invite some people, so if someone could send me a message and let me know everything is going okay, that would be great. Um, so without 
without insurance and knowing that people will choose food over medicine, what are some of the things that people can do to improve their health just with their food choices? With their food choices, the, the go-to is, you know, more leafy green vegetables, more natural foods. That's your own blood thing, no. huh? <laughs> <laughs> I just learned. They can, they can eat iceberg lettuce. <laughs> that's, that doesn't have any vitamins in it, but okay. <laughs> they can eat iceberg lettuce. Okay. Um, so um, not, not a lot of processed foods. Don't go down to the store and get honey buns. You know, grab an apple, grab a pear, um, sodas, grab some juice. If you're diabetic, drink half juice, half water. There are choices out there. You have a sweet tooth, grab a banana. Um, if you like pasta, you can make spaghetti pasta from... Um, Oh, from spaghetti squash or chick, you get from the, the chick spaghetti pea. squash. Yeah, you can get the chickpea pasta. It's good. So, this you know, there are yeah. alternatives. Yeah. You know, but the, again, with minority health, a lot of our people grew up with fried chicken, um, pies, cakes, cookies, rice, be, uh, rice and beans and, and smothered pork chops and now I'm getting hungry. Um, <laughs> so our population, you know, with our foods that we eat is another downfall for us. You know, compared to our fair brothers and sisters, they grew up eating lean and green. You know, we didn't. You know, when I hear my husband talking about, you know, how, you know, um, his family and from the history of the South on how they had to eat, you know, and scramble with the grits and, you know, with the hominy and, you know, all things being a northerner. I was like, a what? What's that? <laughs> so, you know, it depends on where you grew up. But oftentimes what I find, you know, with, with our people when they would come into the clinic and mommy, daddy, children are all morbidly obese because they're eating cakes, cookies, pies, fried chicken, fried foods, you know, stuff that is not healthy, processed foods. You know, we are dying by our teeth, as my husband would say. Um, wow. And I, I call it a planned genocide in a way. Because when I look at McDonald's, mm -hmm. who doesn't like McDonald's? Look at Burger King, who doesn't like Burger King? KFC, who doesn't like KFC? To me, the foods, they're oh, wow. altered. You know, our cows, our pigs, well, not pigs, but our cows have antibiotics in them. I call it a planned genocide because they're, we're eating this food and then our disease rates are going up. So we, we have to be healthier by eating smarter. You know, our people are strong. We are the strong ones, but we have to be strong mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. And, you know, as our nation goes forward, you know, we as a people have to be just as strong, if not stronger. But it starts with our health. It starts right. with our health. That's right. You so can't stand shoulder to shoulder with our fair brothers and sisters. Yes, you can't live your dreams if you don't protect your health. So leafy green vegetables, let's eat more fruit. Fruit, that's apples and pears and oranges and grapes and stuff like that. And opt for water. And if you have to have juice, half juice, half water. That's just a good practice for everybody. Whether you uh, have to worry about diabetes or not, that's just a good practice for everybody because there are studies about sugar actually leading to the cause of cancers too. Sugar, so it's the cows, it's the sugar. It's like, wow. And everything has sugar in it. Even the french fries we eat from McDonald's. High fructose corn syrup. You know, I saw that French fry special about how they make it, and they roll those fries in the sugar two, three times. 
I had no idea. It's like, yes. And then salt, sugar and salt, sugar and salt. So it's like, nobody needs to eat that stuff. You're right. It's like, you're right. So let's get back to that conversation, that important conversation with the doctor. So let's say you blew the first conversation because you didn't know. And you've got your medicine and you're taking your medicine and you don't feel good. It's just, you know, you just feel odd, different, a little lightheaded or woozy, never felt that, didn't feel that until you started taking the medicine. What steps should you take at that point? Call the physician, let them know this new medicine I'm taking does not feel good. And, and ask them, can I stop this medicine and will it be safe for me to stop it? So sometimes if you stop a medicine, the, um, the reaction, the outcome is even worse. You always want to be in communication with the doctor. What the doctors like, what I like, is for my patients to say, hey, Dr. Karen, what you gave me is not working. What should I do? If you just go ahead and do it and then want to come in the office and say, I stopped it. It's like, why? Because I wasn't feeling good. It's like, did you call the office? No, I just wasn't feeling good and I stopped it. It's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So here I am going, okay, so now back to square one, have to redo the blood work. Now I'm looking at you like, if I prescribe something else, are you going to do the same thing again? This is what the doctors are thinking. If I go forward with you, are you going to do the same thing again? Are you going to take your own, your own way and not listen to what I'm trying to help you with? And that's the thing that, that the, um, that the perception from these physicians for all these years is a lot of their patients weren't listening to them or simply didn't, didn't have follow-up. They never went back to their doctor's appointments. They just didn't go for whatever reason, whether they couldn't get there or they didn't feel good from the medicine or they stopped trusting the doctor. Okay, and if you don't trust the doctor, because that is, I've had that instance. What do you recommend at that point if you don't trust the doctor? You're allowed to fire the doctor and find one you trust. Okay, see? You are allowed to fire the doctor. Do you have to tell the doctor why you're firing the doctor? Absolutely not. Oh, you just don't go back anymore. You get a new doctor. Right. And then a new doctor will let them know, you know, I need their patient's medical records then you know that I've been fired. <laughs> <laughs> then you know. Okay, I guess that's a good cool way to do it. Okay. But, but you know, when you the main the topic, go ahead. Uh, healthcare disparities, also we have to keep in mind the majority of the physicians are white. There's only maybe 2% that are minorities that are black so you still have that disparity that to find a black physician is far and few between you know for, to find a female physician is far and few between the majority of the american medical association they're white so therefore you know you have that mixture that some of them already have in their mind from whatever they perceive from their life, from their history, oh, I know Aquanetta, she's just going to come once, I'm not going to see her, but that's typical. That's a typical black woman. What's a typical black woman? They don't we really don't know what a typical black they woman is. Know what they are, but that's how they view us. So let's talk about this unspoken health care. Uh-oh, did we lose you? Our guest has frozen. But well, bear with me, we are having some technical difficulties. Our screen is frozen. We will have her log out and log back in. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, log back in, please. We're still here. All right. She's logging back in so that we can talk about the unhealth. There you go, unspoken health care. She made it back. I'm like, I'm like, I'm just talking to myself. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I know, I just got a chat that says, oh, she's still talking. Okay. So I have uh, some chats here. I'm trying to figure out how to get them on the side. Um, so, okay. Now, so unspoken health care. So tell us about unspoken health care. I think I'm just like freaked out. It's like, God, what is it? Are they talking about me behind my back? What's happening? <laughs> Are they not telling me all the truth? Well, the thing is with unspoken health care, that is a term I coined mm -hmm. because when you go into, and I hate to say this, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If I'm right, I'm right. But there's certain treatments and certain medications certain things that will be offered to our white brother and sisters and will not be offered to us, you know? And then why is that? Because I don't have blonde hair. I don't have blue eyes. What, what is that? There, and that's not even just healthcare. It's in jobs. It's in positions, you know, it's all across the board. You know, it's not just in America either. It's everywhere. So do not be disillusioned that it's just here in the U.S. Um, there's certain treatments that will be offered to to others and not to us. There will be certain um, medications offered to others and not women. So, and it's the unspoken health care. And sometimes that is dependent on your physician. I can use myself as an example. I went to the hospital in 2015 and I was not offered treatment for what was going on with me. And I don't know if it was because of the area I was in and I had to leave the area and go south back to where um, I originally moved for, from to get treatment. But... I heard the same person, I heard another person had the same symptoms as I did, and she got the full treatment that I was asking for. And she was white, okay? So there is an underlying stream. And again, education on our parts is imperative. It's imperative. So now when I show up somewhere and I go, my name is Dr. Huntley, they're like, then I had to strike Dr. Poe. The doctor, I know, the Dr. Poe is right. <laughs> Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to do that? Why do I, if I had a gold grill across, across my mouth, if I had braids, why would I be denied the same treatment that you gave Becky with the good hair, as they would say? And why can't I have the same? So yes, that's the unspoken health care. When you go somewhere, be ready to talk to the physician. Be ready to demand the medication and treatment that you so deserve. You know, don't say, I'll take it. Okay, ask them, is this the best treatment for me? Is this the best? Is this going to take care of the problem? Is this it? Or, or is there something else? And don't think that you're being, you know, demanding. Be demanding. It is your God-given right. You are a child of God. It is your God-given right. And this is what I tell my patients. Ask and you shall receive. If you don't ask, they're going to be like, see, yeah, I, they that. got mad at me in the hospital. They finally had to discharge me. <laughs> yeah, I have a, a girlfriend, and it's funny you mentioned that, but a while back she was going to the doctor having some health issues. And nothing was working. I mean, all the meds. And I finally said, you know what? Next time you go back to the doctor, tell him you want the rich white girl treatment. <laughs> so she called me and she said, you know what? I finally said that to the doctor, you know, and I said, well, what happened? And she says, he looked at me and he's paused. And then she asked him, she says, so there is a thing? 
And he said, yeah, if you were wealthy, this is what we would prescribe. And she says, okay, so you're going to prescribe that to me right now. And he did. And it wasn't, I mean, it was even cheaper out of the pocket than it was going the route for minorities. And she got better quickly. Exactly. And that's the other thing. Oftentimes people will look at us as though we don't have money, that we can't afford it. But sometimes those same treatments they give someone they perceive as having money, mm -hmm. that they perceive is higher on the food chain, mm -hmm. the treatment can be even cheaper. And that's the unfortunate part because they're so used, people are so used to us being poor. And that's the unfortunate truth. Wow. So that's the unfortunate truth. Gotta be difficult to have to walk in and look your best and sound your best when your head hurts, your ankle swell, your back hurts, you can't sit down and your blood pressure's high, you know? It's like <laughs> serious. It's like you just don't look good. So having a healthcare partner, because a lot of times when we're meeting goals, uh, I generally advocate that we have an accountability partner. But what about a healthcare partner, someone who goes with you so that, uh, and you all, how would you manage that? You, uh, you make sure they know what questions to ask so that you don't falter. How does that work? If you have a healthcare partner, it could be your husband, it could be your wife, it could even be your mom, it could be your father. It's someone that you explicitly trust with your information. You know, if you don't trust, you know, Auntie Jan, because Auntie Jan's going to go back and tell the whole family, yeah, he had herpes. <laughs> don't take no, that that's person. That's not exactly what you want, in, want anybody to do. Right. Don't take that person. Okay. You, you have someone that you can trust, someone you can have that honest conversation. Say, can you go with me so I don't forget what is wrong with me? And it's not that it's something you're failing to do is that sometimes when you get in front of people it's called the white coat syndrome like i'll walk in people are like and i'm like hello <laughs> hi i'm like hi how are you fine and i'm like <laughs> yeah. it's called the white, the white coat syndrome sometimes i'll walk in without it you know especially when i've identified it Mm -hmm. When I, they're like, hi, Dr. Karen, how you doing? And I won't have the coat on. So, and, and that's a normal phenomenon, you know. And if you know that you suffer from that, take a healthcare accountability partner, someone that you can trust. If you can't trust that person, don't take them. Take someone you trust. It's someone you trust. Okay, so let's just sort of do a really quick recap. Um, know that, that minorities, not just African Americans we've learned, it's the American Indian, it's the Chinese American, and it's other minorities who are not getting the best health care because of the perception that you don't understand, you won't follow the directions, and that um, you don't have any money. It's the perception. So because of that, you have to be your own health care advocate. So Dr. Karen is asking us to keep a journal. She wants us to write down what's going on, when it happened, and sort of a, a small description about what happened and talk to the doctor about that. So don't be, um, don't be confused by his wonderful charm or as she said, his cuteness or his blue eyes. Okay. Hey, doctor. Let's just, hey, just stop that. Not the time for that. Go over your notes and discuss the notes. And be sure you have read a little bit about it going on uh, WebMD. Is there any other places uh, you would recommend people could go to online to get some reliable? Medscape is a good site. What's that again? Mer Medscape. Oh, okay. And they have the Merck manual um, for non-professionals. Okay. Um, and those are free sites too, right? Those are free. Those so are free. You can go in and Google your symptoms and get some ideas. Um, and you're not diagnosing. You just want to have a basis of conversation when you go to the doctor so that you can stay on point. Because usually you have what? 
15 minutes in there? 15 minutes. Yeah, 15 minutes. So you want to make the nurse practitioner is 30 minutes. Okay, so I so I for nurse practitioners because you do get 30 minutes, okay? Um, and they can prescribe, you can prescribe meds too, can't you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. They can prescribe meds too. So they can do all of that. So that way you uh, talk about what's important, you stay on task. And after you, if you're taking the medication and we, we learned also, ask about the trials. That's important. So remind yes. us why that's important again. That's important because you wanna make sure the medication is going to work for you. If you take a medication that's only been tested on Caucasian or American Asians, but they don't have sufficient evidence for African Americans. So is this medication gonna work for me? Right, are so, you gonna be the exception and lose a leg? I don't know, right? Because right. I don't know what it does. Right. Or well, you break out in some terrible rash and you're like, I got a rash. Oh, well. <laughs> and then they say, well, this has never happened before. Right, what did you do? <laughs> we'll prescribe you a cream. <laughs> Exactly, for the rash that you got from taking the medicine because they didn't know how it was going to act. Okay. So tell us what got you started on this path, this path of healing. What got me started on this path, um, truly on this path, is when my father... Um, had his first heart attack and he was in the ICU at the hospital. And you know, my parents are from Haiti, my, my family's from Haiti. And um, I remember walking in the hospital and my mother was sitting there and the doctors were talking down to her. And she kept asking, what's wrong? What's wrong with my husband? What's wrong? So her accent is thick. So they were talking down to her and not telling her the whole truth. And then when I started talking to them, they didn't tell me the whole truth, nor did they give my father the full treatment um, for his heart failure. I, I realize that now with what I know, mm -hmm. and I go back and I review that, and I hate that I know what I know. They did not give him the full treatment, did not. And he ended up dying a few months later because they did not give him the full treatment and the research was available. They didn't give him the right diuretics. They didn't give him the right blood pressure medication. They didn't, they didn't, and they didn't talk to my mother. And I'll never forget, she was sitting there and nobody was talking to us. The ICU nurse was like, oh, he's fine. It's like, does this look like he's fine? He's intubated. They discharge him. He couldn't breathe. Does this look like this is fine? And he ended up dying at 54. Um, so my dissertation was on heart failure and I dedicated, sorry, and I dedicated it to my father. And um, so my passion is to make sure that does not happen to anyone else. I talk to my patients. I talked to the families because that wasn't fair. That wasn't fair. And I know he's looking down on me and he knows that because of him, I'm here. And because of him, not only are you here, but you have helped a lot of patients yourself. And just imagine we're going to start make sure this video posts so that people can learn how to take their health care in their own arm and their own hands so we can't, yeah we can't stress enough that as dr karen says you're in control you pay the doctor so don't go in there acting as if the doctor owes you something uh that you owe the doctor something the doctor actually owes you something and that's good health care with all the information so what would you suggest that we all go and do right now after this show to make sure we um, embrace our new journey of being healthy? Look at all the medicine you take. Look at your, um, your refrigerator. 
<laughs> you have healthy food. Make sure you get rid of expired medications. Make sure you look at your calendar. When was your last doctor's appointment? Look at yourself. Are you where you need to be health-wise? Take inventory of you. And all of us know when we need to lose some weight and we've been eating too many McDonald's french fries with sugar. But they're good. They're bad. <laughs> I don't know. They got pretty bad there for a while. So are they good again? <laughs> no comments. <laughs> no, I don't eat them anymore. So I did break that habit. However, you know, there's a concrete mixer in town that I can't give up, but I guess I'm going to have to watch that too. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you very, very much for taking the time out to join us and persevering and, and going through all of our technical uh, difficulties. Uh, this is our second show on Zoom, and I'd like to bring to my audience practical tips that they can use in their life every day to improve their life. And if you don't have health, you can't live your dream. So having good health is really, really important. So before we close out, is there any last thing you'd like to say or any one tip that you'd like to give us uh, going from here, from this point forward? Did I lose you? Ah, well, it looks like we've lost Dr. Karen again. Um, so uh, we are two minutes from being out anyway. So can you hear us now, Karen? hear you okay so what's the last tip that we could give since the majority of our population suffers from high blood pressure and diabetes what can we do right now to improve our health right now to improve health get out exercise clean out your refrigerator from junk food um don't go to fast food restaurants take care of yourself <coughs> There's only one you. Okay. With that, exercise. And you mean get get up and start moving around, just walking, right? Just walk. Start yeah. walking. Start drinking more water. Yeah. Drink at least a big bottle like this. I drink about three, four of these a day. Okay. You know. Got our marching orders. Three, God, that's about what? Two to three liters of water a day. Yes. You know, try drinking two to three liters of water a day. Exercise. If that's just walking around the house or the or from one Fresh to food. the other. And no Fresh junk, food. What was that? No processed foods. No processed foods. No junk food. No fast food. So you have your marching orders. So I want to hear how everybody has done with that next time. In a week, you should see some big improvements. So let us know. I can be reached on Facebook at the Empower Doctor, Facebook.com Empower Doctor. And then I have an Empowerment Doctor page also, which Facebook, seem, I mean, Zoom seems to get me confused, but send me an email at inspire at champagneconnection.com. Thank you, Dr. Karen Huntley. I am so proud of you. You have done a great job for us sharing this information. I know your father is proud of you. We're proud of you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And just for allowing us to see someone who looks like us, who's in the very field of taking care of us. So with that, I'd like to remind my audience to dream big. I want you to find that heel that you worth taking and I want you to take it. I want you to make today so awesome that yesterday gets jealous. And above all else, do it your way. Remember, life is too short to drink cheap champagne. I'm Stephanie Wilson Coleman, the Empowerment Doctor, and it has been a blast. See you next week where we will discuss the Bell Project. Bye now. You guys have a great evening. Thank you, Dr. Karen. Thank you. Bye. Bye.